Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So today's video is a Q&A video. I'm going to be tackling all of your more personal Q&As in this video. I'm actually splitting this into two parts. So I'm going to be doing a, another Q&A with more kind of fashion and bag related questions. This was suggested by one of my lovely followers, Stacey on Instagram. She suggested that I split it into two and I thought that was a great idea because I was looking at all the questions wondering how I was going to fit them all in and they did kind of neatly go into two camps, either fashion and bag related or personal. So today I'm going to be tackling all of your more personal questions. I hope you guys enjoy this and let's get started. Okay, so I have all of your questions on my phone right here. There are quite a few, so I'm going to see how far along I get. The first question, and this was by far the most popular one, is will you be selling this apartment or renting it out? And this is a bit more of a kind of tricky question. We flip-flop on it a lot. We were originally planning on renting and then we switched to selling, but now I think we're back to renting it. We always try and save up for every property from scratch so not needing to sell an existing property we are renting out our previous flat right now and we were planning on doing the same with this one but the government announced something called a stamp duty cut so for those of you who aren't in the UK stamp duty is basically a property tax so every time you buy a new property you pay a tax on it and it's always a very very chunky amount of money so in order to kind of kickstart the property market they announced a break on this tax up until the 31st of March next year I think it is so it's a great time to buy and sell in the UK at the moment so even though we weren't planning on selling this place we figured we would make the most of the stamp duty cut it, there is kind of a, a boom for sellers as well because obviously there are more buyers as well um, but what we didn't take into account is the fire cladding issues so again if you're not in the UK you probably won't know about this but there have been some fire regulation issues with a lot of apartment blocks, particularly in London. And if it does affect your building, then it basically means you can't get a mortgage to buy a property in this building at the moment. Uh, I do think they are going to resolve it because there is a government fund and everything, but everything is really up in the air. So it went from being quite a good time to sell to quite a bad time to sell. And we only got the results of the survey a few days ago. So we're now leaning more towards renting it out. And I know it seems like quite a big thing to be so casual about, but we were always planning on renting out a property. We were planning on getting another rental closer to where we're going to live just because it's easier to manage and we always like investing in property because we are quite risky with our other investments and we always think property is a little bit more of a safe bet. Obviously it can go up and down as well, but it's a little bit more steady than kind of other avenues. So we were always planning on keeping the equity kind of in this flat in property somewhere. We did think it would be closer to where we're going to live, um, but we're also fine to keep it as well. So we're waiting to see what happens, but it looks like we're going to rent it at the moment. Okay, so the next question is, what prompted you to move out of London? And this wasn't really part of a set plan. We had no intentions of leaving London. And it all started with a conversation about what kind of dog we would get. We're both big dog fans and we wanted a dog for a really, really long time. And it's actually a really big motivator to move, which I know sounds crazy, but we're obsessed with dogs. Um, and so it's always been really upsetting to us that we can't have a dog uh, in our current flat. And some people do make it work, but we just really wanted some outdoor space, particularly because we tend to like quite big dogs as well. And after kind of talking about what kind of dog we would get, we were like, well, we should look at kind of places to live that would allow a dog. So we began looking at places in London and then we made the fatal mistake of deciding to see what we could get for our money outside of London. Top tip if you do live in London, don't do that because there's just no going back at all. And as soon as we did that, we were just like, we need to seriously think about moving out of London because it's just no comparison. And in order to get anywhere decent in terms of the size and the space, we would have to move kind of to the outskirts of London. And for us, it just kind of defeated the purpose. Um, so we began looking at different areas and then we saw some houses that we really liked and it just kind of spiraled from there and then you know a few months later we were booking viewings and now we're moving so it definitely wasn't on the cards um, but now that is happening we're just really really excited about it and the kind of next chapter. What was it like buying during Covid? 
it was really weird to be honest with you and we were looking kind of as soon as this was in the middle of lockdown and then one of the first things to open was the housing market so one of the first things that the government did was allow estate agents to operate again and so we were going to view people's houses sometimes with them in it before I was actually allowed to see my mum or see another household which was totally crazy and really surreal. Um, luckily, all the estate agents that we dealt with were super professional and very, very careful. So, you know, everyone had to use hand sanitizer and wear face masks and there was social distancing. So we definitely felt, you know, as safe as you could given the circumstances, but it also meant that we were pretty careful about what viewings we were booking. So there was no sense of, oh, well, we might as well have a look. You know, every single property we looked at we really qualified and made sure that we were really interested in, otherwise we didn't really think it was worth taking the risk. So I think this time we looked at five houses, I wanna say, and then this one was the last one, and then we didn't look at any more after that just because we kind of knew. The next question is, how do Dan and I manage finances and split expenses? Do you still have separate bank accounts? And there were quite a few questions around this, but kind of that was one that generalized most of them. Uh, so we do still have separate bank accounts. We do have a joint account, but to be honest, I think we're probably going to close it down. We were just talking about this the other week. We opened it with a thinking that we would kind of use that as our main account but we just haven't and we're not very good at dealing with admin either because we're always so busy as well so we're thinking we're going to close it down it's a bit of a faff because it's not with a bank account that either of us use apart from that dan doesn't even know his pin number for that card so it was a good idea in theory um but we do kind of treat our money just in one pool so it doesn't really matter in terms of who pays them what. So we just estimate expenses, you know, Dan pays for some, I pay for others. And if it's a bit uneven, it doesn't really matter to us because again, we just treat it all as the same pot. We didn't always used to do that up until I think two years ago, we treated everything pretty separately. And that was definitely the right decision for us then. But then it got to the point where we were spending so much time doing admin and settling up and it just didn't make sense for us anymore. So. We combined everything and it's been so much easier since. And obviously, you know, we do have quite different spending habits, but you know, Dan's pretty relaxed about it. Dan doesn't really spend any money. He's, um, he's pretty, he's a very cheap person just to kind of live, you know, he buys clothes a few times a year and even then he doesn't have very expensive tastes and that's pretty much it. He likes his technology, but he doesn't really have extravagant habits. Um, I obviously like shopping quite a lot, but I'm also quite disciplined about uh, different pots and putting things into savings and investments. Um, he's much more casual about that sort of thing, but I'm always quite strict about it. So we definitely have different approaches to money, but it kind of works our own funny way. I do think it's about just finding something that works for you as a couple and taking into account your own individual habits. Um, but for us, this more slightly casual approach has really worked and you know, it just, it isn't really kind of a daily issue or anything like that. The next question is, why did your criteria change for the house? Uh, it changed because it kind of had to, because we weren't finding anything that we had originally had in mind. So we had quite particular criteria in terms of the location, how it looked, uh, the size. We were looking at something quite a bit older, maybe something Georgian, like a townhouse. And it was just difficult to find within the very kind of specific location that we were looking. And after a few disappointments where we thought we found the one and then we went to see it and it just wasn't how we expected, we began to broaden the search and it was actually the drive back from one of those disappointing viewings that I saw the house that we bought. I was on right move, which is the equivalent of Zillow in the UK. Dan was driving and I looked at the house and it was beautiful. And it was nothing like what we thought we wanted. You know, it was really, really new. It was quite modern um, and just, again, not what we had in mind. But at the same time, I could see us living there. So I began to talk to Dan about it and I was like, yeah, but that isn't the area we're looking and did we want something that modern? And then when we got home, he looked at the listing and he was like, actually, this is really nice. And it wasn't until a week later that we could view it, but in that time, we kind of got more and more excited about it. And then when we viewed it, we are like, this is everything like what we kind of hoped and expected. And so I think it was the day after we put an offer and kind of here we are. The next question is, what do I do for a living? Uh, so now we run our own company. Um, so I'm full-time on it and Dan still kind of has a job external, but he does it um, kind of 
in the evenings and weekends uh, and we run a tech company so we build we design and build web and mobile applications and that's both for our own projects and also externally for external clients as well we have a team of 15 people now um, mainly kind of developers and project managers and testers and that sort of thing and yeah that's what we do it's not you know particularly glamorous or very fashiony um but we really really love it and we like kind of building things and this is just a very cool way to do that and it's always very cool to see something from an initial idea right through to it actually being live and kind of having customers and that sort of thing so um, yeah, that is what we do. Next question is one that relates to the previous one, which is how did we start our own business? Uh, so this one actually happened really gradually. So Dan had a project where he needed a developer. He met who is now our lead developer, and this was many, many years ago. I think it was like six years ago. And then that project got a little bit bigger, so he brought on someone that he knew. And then honestly, it just kind of happened really organically. And then we had another project, so we needed to hire more people. And then it just got busy enough that I quit my job. Dan still works kind of, you know, evenings and weekends. So, you know, it's getting busier and busier every month. So I don't know what the future holds in terms of that. Um, but yeah, it happened just very organically just growing the team one by one it is crazy if we stop and think about that we're responsible for like 15 people's mortgages so that can be a little bit scary but it's definitely a privilege and one that you know we're very very happy to have a little bit scary as well um but yeah it's it's grown slow and steady, you know, it's been six years, so definitely not overnight, but just added people one by one as the work's kind of come in. The next question is a few questions in one, and again, it's kind of relating to the business. How long have Dan and I worked together? Considering you and Dan work together, how do you separate your business relationship from your personal relationship? Uh, so we've worked together on this kind of current business, um, I guess, five years it would be um so it kind of started off just his and then I came on board um but I mean honestly from year one pretty much you know and that's something that we really bonded over we both have a huge huge passion for business and I've not met anyone in my life ever who's ever liked business as much as I have and so we both kind of found that with each other and so from year one we were getting involved with each other's projects and so you know in terms of how long we've worked together it's pretty much as long as we've been together in terms of managing that relationship we for our kind of day-to-day -day business we do separate things out we have very very different skill sets as well so what i'm good at he's not good at and vice versa the things where he's really strong i'm terrible so it works quite well in that way um but also we just are quite aligned in terms of our business goals and because we like business so much we tend not to let it bleed into our personal relationship so if we do argue it's usually because of personal things it's very rare that we argue about business matters just because i think there's an element of you know having your own business is actually really really hard so if we're going to fight a battle it's probably not going to be with each other you know it's probably about external elements and things that are happening and um, so very rarely do we actually fight um just within the business or within our kind of business roles and that rarely kind of bleeds into our personal relationship so sometimes you know we'll fight personally and then you know we'll be a bit off with each other in terms of the business as well but we try and keep it professional um and usually it is that way around rather than the other way around the next question is also about businesses i got a lot of business related questions um and it is how did you end up starting the christmas tree business so for those of you who don't know we do have a christmas tree business which i know is really really random um but the answer is i did not start the christmas tree business it was dan and he dragged me into it basically so he started this the very first year that we met so we met in the october and then he was going live with this business um, a couple of weeks later and it was just a disaster like it did not go well um, but Dan is also very stubborn so he is not one to give up so he carried it on and a year later obviously we'd been together for over a year so I was pretty invested in Dan and I wanted him to succeed and so I volunteered to help him and that meant that year 
standing on a Christmas tree stand for every weekend in December. I have a really funny photo which I'll put on screen and it's basically me on a Christmas tree stand in an enormous coat and Ugg boots just being the coldest person ever. It was so so cold and I was working my office job so during the week, Monday to Friday, I'd be working in my office job and then on the weekends, I would spend my time doing that. And it was so cold, it was literally like the kind of cold that seeps into your bones. And so I would still be cold on like Monday and Tuesday. It would take me that long to recover and I had a couple of days of warmth and then I would do it all over again. Keep in mind, I also wasn't being paid for this. I was just doing this out of love. Um, and so I just kind of got started in that way. And then obviously as we got more serious, I began to be involved more on the business side of things and now we're online only. So thankfully I do not have to spend my weekends in December on Christmas tree stands. Um, but yeah, that's basically the story. Dan started it and I got dragged into it. The next question is any tips for asking for more from work, for example, salary? Uh, and I do think this is a tricky one to answer because I do think it depends on your work environment. You know, different companies require different things, certainly large companies to small companies. Um, but I would say I was always really aggressive in trying to get more money. And I know that the word aggressive isn't something that, you know, is traditionally seen as a good trait in women, but I think it's important to be really active in trying to pursue more money. and any sense of, you know, you shouldn't ask for more money because it's greedy or, you know, you should want to work not for the money, that shouldn't be your main motivator. I think it's just nonsense, to be honest. I think that it's just a way for companies to try and pay you less. Um, so I would always just be very active, um, whether that's negotiating when you change job or just in your current job. And even if you don't get a pay bump the first time you ask, at least it plants it in your superior's mind that you do want a pay rise. So the next time that you ask, and I would encourage you to ask again, at least it's not kind of a surprise on your information and you're that much more likely to get it the second time. And if you keep asking, and even if they keep saying no, it absolutely will be in their mind that they can't keep saying no because otherwise they will lose you. So as long as you're in a strong position at work in terms of your reviews are good and you're bringing good things and getting good feedback, I would definitely make sure to bring up on, you know, not all the time by all means, but on a semi-regular basis, just kind of plant it in your boss's mind that you do want more money and you do see your value to the company being represented in your salary. Next up is, can you share any tips on diversifying your revenue streams outside of your day-to-day -day work? Uh, tips for starting your own business. So I do think that those two questions are quite similar. Obviously you have passive types of income like property and investments, um, but in terms of more instant revenue, that would mostly come from having your own business or your own side hustle. Uh, I think there are two kind of elements to this. One is starting your business and knowing what to do. and I think it's a little bit of a myth that your business has to be something that you're totally passionate about because overwhelmingly what Dan and myself are passionate about is business. So we always say that, you know, we don't care if we sell toilet roll and that's our business. You know, we like building things from the ground up. And I used to work in kind of just an office job marketing for different people. And when I first started, I kind of had very specific ideas about what I was marketing and the products that I was marketing. So I wanted to go into luxury hotel marketing, which is what I did. But I quickly found out that actually the difference between marketing luxury hotels and the difference between marketing toilet roll is nothing. You have to do the exact same things. You have to send the same emails. You have to do the same ads. It's all exactly the same. And just because you're marketing nice hotels doesn't mean that you spend your life in nice hotels. So that kind of applies to everything i think so don't think that you know if you really like handbags for example your business has to be around your passion you know your business can be anything as long as you actually like the process of building up a business and there really is opportunity everywhere you know i read stories all the time about people just keeping their eyes open and spotting opportunity I was reading the other day about a woman who is smashing it, I think, on Etsy with her face masks, and she was one of the first to sew her own face masks in really cute designs, and now she has created this amazing little business over the space of a couple of months. So there is always opportunity if you just keep your eyes open. The other element to having your own business, though, is I would say you have to make sure that you have, I guess, the grittiness to see it through, because 
The thing about having your own business, especially when you're doing it in addition to your regular job, is that it's really, really thankless most of the time. And it'll probably be a little while before you're making any money and any profit. And so you have to have the will to continue even when there's no reason to continue other than you just want to, if that makes sense. Because unlike with a regular job where you probably have a boss or a superior who gives you feedback, maybe even praise, you don't have that when it's you know your own thing. You just have to be willing every day to get up and try your hardest. And even though you know it's probably just costing you money, it's costing you time, and you're tired because you have another job, it's just the will to keep going with the knowledge that hopefully one day it will turn into something better. And you know, one thing that is true is that it will always usually require a lot of sacrifice, again, especially if you're trying to do this in addition to a full-time job. And even if it is your full-time job, having your own business is time consuming and stressful and emotional and it, it, it is really really hard and Dan and I have been together I think eight or nine years I'd say now and in that time we've been on holiday together I think three times and it's just because it's almost impossible for us to have time off together because one person always needs to be available to manage the team so it definitely doesn't come without sacrifices you know we still haven't been on our honeymoon it was supposed to be this August but obviously COVID um but you know regardless of where you're at in terms of your business life cycle it definitely requires commitment and sacrifice and it's really hard but as long as you keep in mind your overall goal and you know what's driving you i do think it's 100 percent worth it the next question is about investing uh, so tips on investing so i would say that i am not an expert when it comes to investing i do not know what i'm doing which is why i don't stock pick i invest in companies and trust other people to know more than i do um, my two things here are one invest early so this is the one thing that i wish i had done differently when i was younger i always had it in my mind that i had to have hundreds of thousands of pounds to invest because investing was for rich people and that's just not true. You know, I wish I'd started when I could only afford to put in kind of 50 pounds because I'd have an awful lot more than that now. So even if, you know, you could only afford to put in a little bit, I'd say start early, try and contribute regularly. And what happens then is you will benefit from the magic of compounding interest. So, you know, you'll put in, 100 pounds let's say or 100 dollars and then you'll earn a bit of interest on that and as long as you invest that interest the next time you earn something it will be on your original amount and the interest you earned and that way you really can build up wealth over the long term and it really does make a difference over many years so even if you know you can only afford to do a little bit I would say start as soon as you can. I wish I had done that differently. I only started investing a few years ago and I wish I'd done it much sooner than I did. So 100% always start early. That is my biggest tip. I would also say that it's really important to do it for the long term as well. So don't feel um, pressured to kind of put in more money than you can afford to, especially if you're going to need the money in the kind of near future. Even if it's a year or two away, you really have to be looking very, very long term in terms of your investments because then you can ride out any waves. I had a lot of people message me when COVID hit and the stock market crashed, whether I was going to pull my money out. And for me, that's the worst time to pull your money out because then you lock in those losses. So make sure that any money that you do put into investment accounts, you can afford to not touch for many, many years. And then you will really see the returns on your investment, but you have to make sure that you don't need your money kind of in the near future. So make sure that you're only investing what you can afford. Do try and start early though and try and contribute regularly, um, but definitely keep in mind that it's for the long term. So you need to be looking at 10 and 20 years, but you will, if you start early and you do it regularly, you'll set yourself up very well for the long term. Uh, in terms of the companies that I use, so I mentioned I don't stock pick, uh, I just don't know enough about it. So I trust other people to know what they're doing a lot more than I do. I invest with Wellsimple in the UK primarily. They also operate in Canada and the US. And I also use Moneybox, but Wellsimple is kind of my main investment fund and they're great their customer service is really good you can also choose your risk appetite so you can do high risk low risk and moderate and you can also choose if you want sustainable investing as well so you do offer you a few choices but 
other than that it's really simple you know you just put your money in they invest it for you and then you can just log in and check your balance so it's really fuss free investing uh, I wish I'd done it a lot sooner than I did um, but yeah I've been really really happy with them and finally the very last question is the favorite thing about the new house um, and this is an easy one it's the kitchen the kitchen is beautiful it is the kitchen of my dreams I think we're going to be a little bit scared to use it if I'm honest um, but yeah it's absolutely beautiful but there are so many things to love about um, the new house it has a garden as well which London is that's a rare thing so we're really excited about that and I think we're just excited to have a little bit more space we're excited to get settled as well because it's close enough now that we're getting a little bit kind of worried and stressed about the move and boxes and everything so we're looking forward to being in um but yeah having more space uh, but in terms of a particular feature I'm really really excited about the kitchen so that is it for this video guys I hope you enjoyed it I hope that I answered your question apologies if I didn't feel free to leave me a comment down below and I will try and get back to you if I didn't answer your question as I said though I will try and answer all the kind of fashion and bag related ones in another video if you enjoyed this Q&A please do give us a thumbs up and as always thank you so much for watching I will see you in my next one bye guys